Thanks for tuning in to the Move Mind podcast. This episode, we're going to talk about where to start with strength and conditioning for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. As you've probably gathered by now, I'm a pretty avid Jiu Jitsu player. Hobbyist, yes, recreational, not professional, but it still takes up a large portion of my life. And also strength and conditioning is a big part of my life. Being a strength coach is my day job. And I get asked all the time from people that I train with, people that I meet, and even digitally via messages, etc. Where should I start with lifting for jiu-jitsu? Do I even need to lift? So the goal of today's episode is to go through a few questions that I get asked pretty regularly and try and give you some answers, some insights, some opinions of mine on how to go about it as it can be a bit of an ambiguous area to start with if you're not familiar with lifting in the S&C world. Um, so let's get stuck into it straight away. So where would you start for getting into S&C for BJJ? Let's just start with the advantages, the pros if you like, for doing it because there's arguments for and against, I'm sure. I'm biased for the four. Well, let's start there. The main reason for strength and conditioning for sports performance is to try and reduce the time away from the sport due to injury. Now that's not necessarily saying you're going to prevent injury. Jiu-Jitsu is a sport littered with injuries. I've had my fair share over the years. In some regard, they're unavoidable at a certain point you're going to get at least one in your grappling journey. So that being the case, we can't make the claim that S&C is going to stop injuries. But by performing strength and conditioning routines in the gym, away from the mats, we can at least increase our time spent on the mats by trying to decrease our exposure to injury by kind of bomb-proofing the body, toughening it up, conditioning it, strengthening it, joints, ligaments, tendons, muscles, etc. by using overload in the gym. So that's the main reason why you would do S&C, is to reduce the time away from the mat. So arguably to spend more time doing jiu-jitsu, weirdly, even though you're going to have to sacrifice a little bit of time to do the lifting. Another reason for strength and conditioning for BJJ or even for sport in general is you're trying to build in the S&C world what's called a general physical preparedness foundation or a GPP foundation. What does that mean? Well in a nutshell in order to adapt to specific qualities, specific types of strength, speed strength, strength speed, strength endurance etc you need to have a baseline of strength. You need to have a basic level of general preparedness. If general preparedness is the foundation, we can layer special preparation on top. But you can't necessarily layer special preparation on top of no foundation. The body is not going to uptake that adaptation that you want, the special adaptation, as well as if it has the general foundation underneath it. So strength and conditioning allows you at the very least to build a general physical preparation foundation to keep you prepared, ready for specific adaptations. Now in Jiu Jitsu you could argue that GPP work is what you might term off season or the non-competitive season. It's keeping you ready but you're not necessarily competition ready. And then once you have a competition booked in, you start to work towards more specific qualities that match the intensity and type of, a, of atmosphere that the competition represents. So your training will, will change gradually as you approach the competition. But you've got to have that foundation first. So SNC allows for that foundation. And then lastly, I'm sure you've heard this plenty of times. If two jiu-jitsu athletes are the same skill level, the stronger of the two is going to have the advantage. That's just undoubt undoubtable. I'm sure you've rolled against someone who's technically as good as you, but they're stronger than you, and it's difficult to deal with. So why not have that strength 
available. Not to say that technique shouldn't be prioritized first, it should. Mechanics should be prioritized, efficiency, etc. But being strong, carrying out those technical sort of proficiencies, there's no problem with that. So that's a kind of brief case for the, the pros and the advantages of doing S and C for BJJ. I think it's well worth everybody's time to do it. If most professional sporting organizations, teams, athletes in the world have some sort of S and C program, the chances are that S and C does work, providing it's done properly. So there's the there's the case for it, in my opinion. Okay, next question that I get asked a lot, and I understand why people ask it, especially if you're new to the strength training world. Should you lift weights or just do body weight exercises, or as the last couple of years, calisthenics, because it's kind of cool and, and been like a, a more popular term. Lift weights or calisthenics? So you're kind of jumping a, the gun a little bit by asking that question. And I think it's the wrong question to be asking, personally because lifting weights and doing calisthenic exercises are both forms of strength training and they are both forms of overloading the muscles and tendons and ligaments in a way that then they adapt and get stronger. They're just tools. So you're asking which tool is better? Well, it depends. In my opinion, you need both body weight exercises and weightlifting or lifting weights in your program. Body weight exercises lend themselves to what we call the relative strength end of the spectrum. Ring gymnasts, for example, some of the strongest strength athletes in the world, relatively speaking. And lifting a barbell with plates on lends itself to the absolute strength end of a spectrum. So how much load you can move external to your body. Well, grappling is a mixture of moving another opponent around, external, but also being able to control your own body through space, relative. So you need relative strength and absolute strength. So should you lift weights or do body weight exercises? The answer is both, I think. So instead of asking which of the two should you do, you should be thinking more about your own schedule, which we'll get to next. What is your weekly schedule like and how you're actually going to balance your strength and conditioning sessions with jujitsu. What is contained in those strength and conditioning sessions we'll visit in future episodes because that's important too. But that's zooming in. At the moment, keeping an overview and an introduction to S&C for BJJ, you will be using various tools to get stronger. And we'll also get to the practicality of that with equipment access soon. So schedule and balancing time in the gym with mat time. The biggest argument I see against S&C for BJJ is that it takes away from time spent on the mat. I think Marcelo Garcia is probably one of the most famous examples of world-class grappling prowess that didn't really perform any S&C. So why? Well, because he spent all his time on the mat. Did he have injuries? Probably. Could he have mitigated some of those injuries by training in the gym? Possibly. Where does it go from there? Well, he is somewhat of an outlier too. He was a small guy, very, very good at jiu-jitsu. Just because you lift in the gym and you do S&C training doesn't mean that you have to detract entirely from your mat time. What you've got to understand is mat time does take priority. Okay? If you're a BJJ player, hobbyist, professional, whatever it is, your priority should be to get better at jiu-jitsu. We're not trying to make you into a powerlifter or Olympic weightlifter per se. We'll steal some of their ideas, but we're not trying to make you a competitive leader in those sports, we're trying to make you better at jiu-jitsu. So the first question you want to ask yourself in relating to balancing gym time and mat time is how many days a week do you like to train jiu-jitsu? 
So out of your seven day Monday to Sunday cycle, your week cycle, how many days do you like to train jiu-jitsu? Okay. And then you need to ask yourself, how many days a week do you actually train jiu-jitsu on average? Because we could all like to train jiu-jitsu seven days a week, but how many times do you actually go? What can you actually handle? It's more about what your body can handle versus what you like. So the real honest question is, how many days do you actually train jiu-jitsu on average? And you can track this over the course of the month and take an average. So once you've got that figure, it might be twice a week that you actually go. It might be five times a week, whatever. That, that number is important. The number that you train, number of days you train per week on average, is the number you want to keep in mind and stick to. And this is what you'll be basing your lifting around. Because those days per week for jiu-jitsu take priority. And then lastly, this is kind of related to how many days you actually train. How many days a week can you train jiu-jitsu, still improve, and not be completely exhausted or have a higher risk of injury? I found in my own jiu-jitsu journey there is a tipping point. The difference between training six days a week and seven days a week is actually a big difference for me. If I train seven days a week without a day off, I notice there's detriment there. Just bear in mind that I have a day job as well. I'm not doing this professionally. I don't just get to train jiu-jitsu, go home and rest, train jiu-jitsu, go home and rest, train jiu-jitsu again, go home and rest, sleep, and then do it all again. I have to train jiu-jitsu and then go to work, like most of us do. So there's a difference there. Six days a week, five days a week is good for me. Seven days a week, there's a tipping point and it's diminishing returns at that point. So bear in mind <clears throat> how many days you train a week on average, but is that good for you? Are you still improving? Is that number too low? Are you just not going forwards and your game has stayed the same for years? Does it need to be increased by a day a week or a couple of hours per week? Or are you training a lot and your output is good per se in terms of numbers of days per week, but you're getting injured all the time, you're always exhausted. If you're getting injured all the time and you're always exhausted, you're not going to be able to add S&C sessions on top of that. You're going to have to back off. And likely if you're not improving in jiu-jitsu because you're not training enough, you might not necessarily need to think about adding S&C sessions per se. It might just be that you need to add another day a week for jiu-jitsu if you want to improve at that. But if you're training infrequently and you're getting injured, then it might be a case of adding one more jiu-jitsu session and a couple of lifting sessions too. So you see where I'm going with this. Like you have to find out these numbers for yourself and the easiest way to do this is just track this over a month and then look back at that month. Providing that month didn't contain like a freak illness period or injury period. It was like a normal training month for you. Depending on your age, training history, natural talent, most people answer around three to five days per week of jiu-jitsu training recreationally. Mine is about five days per week. So once you've found out your schedule of how many jiu-jitsu days you, you're going to do, the next logical question is how many days can you dedicate to doing S&C alongside that baseline number of jiu-jitsu days. Remember, we don't want the jiu-jitsu days to change. We're just going to add in a couple of S&C sessions. So I suggest to everybody that asks me these kind of questions is start with two S&C sessions per week and try it for six weeks whilst maintaining your jiu-jitsu baseline number of training sessions per week. If you do just two S&C sessions per week, you'll avoid burning out. And if you do more than two, there's a chance you might add too much to the system too quick. And now you'll find that you're not able to recover and everything's going south. So better to start low, start with two days a week, and we can always increase from there if need be. But often two sessions a week of 60 minutes or slightly less per session, you can get everything you need to do to help you with your S&C for Jiu Jitsu. So an another term that you probably heard me throw around just there was training age. So this is another set of questions you need to ask yourself because this will help dictate 
how you're going to go forwards. Training age, defined as how many years have you been following an SNC program in the gym at a minimum frequency of two days per week. So it's measured in years. Training ages of sort of zero to one years is like absolute beginner. One to three or four years is kind of around beginner to intermediate. Above four years is usually intermediate four to six years and then sort of above six, seven, eight years is advanced. In my experience, that's usually what you find. Most people that do jujitsu are in the beginner to intermediate realm, mostly beginners, to be honest. Most people that ask me these questions have a training history of zero. So if your training age is under one year, go and find an SNC coach, is my opinion. Go and source one so that you can get some instruction on how to perform the basic lifts that you're going to need to perform in your program. Squat patterns, hinge patterns, presses, pulls, carries, and learning how to brace. Learning how to brace is probably one of the most important thing I teach everybody that I work with lifting wise, as it stops you getting injured unnecessarily in the gym when you're lifting heavier weights. And it's just an important skill to learn. It should be taught in schools, in my opinion. So you need to go and find a coach if you can. A good S&C coach that can teach you those basic lifts. You can learn from books and the internet, but you are risking hurting yourself when there's external load or sketchy body weight positions, gymnastic positions. The hardcore DIY folk among, among you will want to set up a camera and try and learn from trial and error. I did that for a long time. But this takes about 10 times as long as training with a coach. Training with a coach can shortcut that so much faster. And if you have the ability to do it, I'd say do it 100%. Because when even when you're looking back at a camera set up on your own training, you don't even know what you're looking for in terms of errors. And so it's not really as objective as you think looking through a third person perspective of the camera because you don't even know what you're looking for in terms of bad technique etc whereas a coach does or at least they should so I would go and find a coach if you haven't been training for longer than a, at least a year and that will help get you started um, I can also give more information in the next few episodes of what to look for in an SNC coach. If you can find an SNC coach that does Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, even better. Or if they have a background in even wrestling or judo or any other grappling sports, that would be great. Even mixed martial arts. If your training age is over one year and you're already competent in the basic lifts, you'll be able to hit the ground running a little bit faster. Ultimately, strength is a skill. Learning to perform the different patterns and weightlifting kind of movements lifting movements it takes a little bit of practice you know it does take pretty much the first year to kind of grease the wheels and express the latent strength that you've got within you and then you can start building upon that as it's technical for those of you that have already been lifting for at least a year you'll know that and when you hit the ground running with a good snc program you'll realize that's because you've put in a year already. If you haven't, a coach will help you get onto that, that, that pathway. So that's a little bit about training age. Equipment. So this is where I see the most obstacles, usually, funnily enough, especially since the COVID era began. So most of our money as grapplers is spent on grappling memberships, club memberships. And if we have any spare cash, we usually put it towards a gi or a new rash guard or some sort of clothing to help us train more. The reality is, if you want to get some good S&C training in, you're going to need access to, in my opinion, at the bare minimum, a barbell with plates. And then preferably kettlebells, dumbbells sandbags, cables, rings, etc. Gym equipment from the TRX all the way to the barbell. But I'd say ultimately, because you can do a lot of body weight exercises without equipment, the barbell and plates is the king 
of equipment if you could get it. I really, I really believe that. It's the king of overload. And in fact, the COVID era proved just how much we love the barbell in strength and conditioning for sports performance. Because although when you're traveling, using a TRX and a yoga mat is good, when we were in the lockdown periods, we noticed that people didn't have a lot of access to gyms anymore. And to get that level of progressive overload to get absolutely stronger can't really be done. You're not going to get absolutely stronger just by doing bodyweight squats. You're going to need some sort of external load to help with that. So you're going to need access to a barbell and plates. It's cool going down the park and trying to lift some rocks and logs and stuff. But the beauty of the barbell with plates is it's super measurable. It's trackable. It's calibrated. It's, it's simple. There's a reason it's been around for a while because it just works. It's not to say that you can't program good body weight stuff and get to a high level. Working with logs and stones and tires, you can get strong. Of course you can. But you want to think about strength and conditioning is sampling from a toolbox of various implements, various different weight training pieces of equipment. It's not just one or the other. So really, in short, the gym with lifting equipment wins. doesn't have to be a commercial gym necessarily, but the gym with gym equipment wins when it comes to strength and conditioning. If your training age is under a year, you can hit two birds with one stone and hire a coach for an hour at a time and use their equipment at that time. So you can get your lifting session in and you get coaching and you don't have to worry about buying any of that equipment. So that is the plus side if you're new to lifting is the coach will help you and you get to use all their stuff. So that's just a brief overview of where should you start. I hope that's been helpful. It's an interesting journey combining S&C with Jiu Jitsu. It's great fun trying to balance it all out and figure out how you respond to it all. My goal as a strength coach is to start helping more grapplers get hold of this information and implement it, as I think S&C is really powerful. It's fun. Lifting is fun. A lot of people think it's boring. It's just because they haven't usually been coached on where to find the fun in it. There's lots of fun to be had. And it's a great feeling getting stronger and working hard in the gym, working smart in the gym, and feeling it pay off into forms of resilience on the mat. If you just grapple all the time, and this kind of goes back to the beginning of the episode, if you just grapple all the time and don't do any maintenance around the body regarding S&C, whether that is mobility stuff, flexibility stuff, strength stuff, those are usually the basics. You're probably going to find that you get achy, sore, pain starts to creep up, joints start to feel a bit sketchy. I've seen that time and time again. People that have a training age of zero, they just train all the time in jiu-jitsu, and then they come and ask me, you know, have you got any ideas regarding my painful dot, dot, dot. Sometimes I end up working with these people on a one-to-one -one basis with strength coaching and you find in you know, eight to 12 weeks that, that pain has significantly decreased, if not disappeared, because it was there due to them not maintaining their bodies off of the mat. And just by introducing a little bit of simple maintenance and some simple strength training, those aches and pains went away. Now, obviously, if it's an injury, I'll refer them out to a physio. And if the physio gives them the green light to train with me, then we'll train and get going. But if it's like these aches and pains, which aren't really from an acute injury per se, very often they clear up quite quickly with just some basic strength training. Because grappling takes such a toll on the body, it's quite pull heavy as a, as a movement matrix. It's quite grip heavy. And very often the upper back will get tight and rounded as the rounded position is favorable to playing on the bottom a lot of times in jiu-jitsu. Creating tension and then strains in the lower back, etc. So if you don't address these things, they will compound and you will get to a point where it's uncomfortable. And living should be more comfortable than not 
You should train for periods of discomfort, but you don't want that discomfort to creep into the rest of your life. So there'll be a few more episodes like these going out. Next one, we're going to look a little bit more into what should a strength and conditioning session contain based around training frequency of twice per week. So we'll go down that wormhole a little bit and try and explain some training methods that I think are suitable and useful for grapplers to employ straight away. Hope you enjoyed this show and I'll catch you next time.